Right now, I just want to introduce some of the key people who have helped in this project. Um, a year ago, we set out deciding that we want to make our digital photos more accessible to the public. We've been digitizing for 15 years, and never before were our photos available online for free to the public. So Pasadena Public Library, Pasadena City College, and the Pasadena Museum of History came together and decided to create one single collaborative database to put all of our photos together. And tonight, we're launching it, so everyone now has free access to all of our photographs. We have almost 1,000 there, and we have room for up to 10,000 currently. So it's going to continue growing every day, so keep checking back. Right now, I just want to introduce some of the key people who have helped in this project. Um, a year ago, we set out deciding that we want to make our digital photos more accessible to the public. We've been digitizing for 15 years, and never before were our photos available online for free to the public. So Pasadena Public Library, Pasadena City College, and the Pasadena Museum of History came together and decided to create one single collaborative database to put all of our photos together. And tonight, we're launching it, so everyone now has free access to all of our photographs. We have almost 1,000 there, and we have room for up to 10,000 currently. So it's going to continue growing every day, so keep checking back. Um, I want to say a special thank you to Barry Gold, who he was like the genius for our website. He volunteered, he did all this for us volunteer work, and I really appreciate it. So I just wanted to say thank you to Barry. And <laughs> um, you are now an honorary member of the Pasadena Museum of History. So um, you have like, your, like lifetime membership to the museum. So <laughs> whenever you want to come back to visit us, you're welcome to do that. Well, I, you know, Hub did all the design. All I did was implement an HDMI. No, but you did so much work, and we really, really appreciate it. <laughs> um, I want to introduce Linda Stewart. She, um, about eight months ago, we were in this room, and we were all we were training about 12 people on how to, to use Content DM and how to create this database. And Linda was like the brains behind that. Um, <laughs> Um, she's now working part-time at Pasadena City College, so luckily we have her in the area, so whenever we need her, we can go grab her. Um, but right now she's going to show us just an overview of the database, the website, and how you can search the images, okay? So thank you, Linda. So for many of you, this is going to be the unveiling, the first time look at this site. Um, these organi organizations have done an amazing job of putting together a really interesting digital preservation or digital presentation for you. Um, I should tell you that Pasadena is somewhat unique in that you have institutions of different types that got together and made this happen. Frequently what we see with digital projects is the university will have theirs. A community college, that's really pretty rare that a community college will have a digital collection, but in this case Pasadena does. And very, very few publics have large um, digital collections that are available online. And it's even more rare to see these institution types all work together to really present a nice digital collection for you online. I should tell you that while you're here from Pasadena and you're going to be looking at your local materials, um, oftentimes what we find is these digital collections more than being viewed by the residents within the community, they're viewed from all over the world. So you'll have a lot of people that perhaps may have lived in Pasadena at one time, move away and come back and find or find this collection online. And oftentimes they'll just do things like a Google search and they'll find one of the images from this collection and follow the bread trail back to discover other digital um, photographs and things that you've made available. So this really is a, a very unique opportunity. So let's take a look at um, the site itself. Um, they have uh, the URL for this is actually Pasadena Digital History. Very easy to remember. This is um, the landing page. When you click on Pasadena uh, Digital History, this is the page that you will um, initially um, come to. You'll notice that on this screen, there's a lot of information in activity, okay. Um, a lot of information about um, the digital um, collaboration. Across the top here, you'll see there's information about the partners, so the three institutions that are participating in this. Uh, we're going to take a take a look at this next link in a minute. Uh, this will actually take us to some individual virtual collections that they have created. There's also, if you click on exhibit, this will take you out to 
uh, Pasadena through the eyes of Myron Hunt. So you can take a look at a video clip that's been created um, to give you, um, again, some, and some more feel and understanding of Pasadena's history. Then there's some resources available for you if you want to take a look at those. And then if you want to contact any of the institutions, if you have questions about the collections, if you perhaps know something about some of the images that are part of the collection, if you want to order a copy of, say, one of the photographs that's on the website, all of the contact information is provided for you here on this screen so you can get in touch with the different institutions. I'm going to move to the left side of the screen here. And the first search box that we encounter is here on the left hand side. It is a keyword search box. So you can enter a term and what it will do is it will go out and search the data about all of these images across all the collections. There are actually three unique collections that are part of the Pasadena um, Digital History Collaboration. And this particular search box will allow you to just do a keyword search across all of those. Um, I'm going to enter the name Pamela Prather. I know that she was one of the um, uh, Rose, Bowl, Rose Bowl queens. So we'll go ahead and enter the search term. <laughs> well, let's do that again. Let's do it up here. What this has done right now is that it's taken you from the landing page and actually into Content DM. Okay, so we were searching for images of Pamela Prather, one of the Rose Bowl queens. Up on the screen right now, what you see is kind of like a spreadsheet. You'll see the um, thumbnail image. If you click on that thumbnail image, you'll see that we'll get to an access image, a JPEG image. And there's a little bit of descriptive information about each one of these images. So you can see the title. You can see the subjects, subject headings that have been added um, to the metadata for these images. And then you'll see to the far right that they've included some description. And this is usually of, most, of interest to most of us. It's like, what can you tell me about that photograph? So if I want to take a look at, say, the second photograph here of Pamela, double click on it. It opens up the image, and you see both the access image here as well as the small thumbnail. If I want to look at this in greater detail, across the top of the screen here, you'll see a toolbar that will allow you to go ahead and magnify that if you'd like to. Um, <coughs> You can also crop various sections of the photo. So if you really want to take a look at that crown and blow that up, you can do that. Most of the utilities that you'll find here once you get into the actual um, image file are very common to most of the uh, tools that are out there now for you when you're working with digital images. So you'll be able to enlarge, enhance. Um, you can look at various um, quadrants of the digital image. Now if we look down below the digital image, we want to know information about um, this particular image. This is where you will find all of the, the metadata or the information really about this particular digital image. So you can see that um, in addition to the title, I could find out color information or the size of that original photo. I know that that's now an 8 by 10 photo. Um, there are some notes. Um, so something that we would probably think of as kind of a description. Um, there is information that was on the back of that photograph and that is available for you there. Any of the terms that you see that are in black, or I'm sorry, are in green as opposed to black, you can go ahead and click on those and those will execute a new search for you. So if I happen to click on, um, say, one of those subject headings there, uh, if we did Beauty Contestants California Pasadena 1959, that would execute a whole new search and I would have a new search result set. If you want to get back to 
that landing page that we first came across for the Digital History Collaboration. If you just click on the logo here on the far left, that will take you back to our starting page. The next thing that I want to show you is a couple of um, virtual collections that the institutions have created for you. Uh, there happens to be four of them right now, and you would get to those by clicking on collections, and you'll see that there is a representative image from each one of those collections, and you get a little bit of information um, as far as the title and, and gives you some clues as to what that collection is about. Now these are virtual collections, which means that if you happen to click on the Rose Bowl or you happen to click on Old Town Pasadena, you may be seeing images from the Pasadena Public Library, it could be from Pasadena City College, or it could be from the museum. So they're searching across the collections and pulling together these materials for you. Um, the first one that we're going to take a look at is Old Town Pasadena. So here again is my search results screen. You'll see the thumbnails here over on the side and of course information about each one of these images. But if you look to the far right, you'll see that one of the things the software has done is it's taken information from each one of these digital records and it's provided this to you in faceted form, meaning that if I wanted to take a look at, out of the, what, 34 images that I have here of, I'm sorry, 84 images that I have here of Pasadena's Old Town, and I wanted to look for a particular photographer. So now that I know who took photographs of the Old Town area, let's say I want to look at Hill. So it's going to take that group of photographs that were in my original search results, and it's going to then offer up to me these two images where the photographer was um, Hill, and he was photographing here in Pasadena in about the 1890s. You may also notice across the top here um, in the search results, where it tells you search results for Old Town and then Hill. It provides kind of a, a, a trail for you, a breadcrumb. So if I want to go back and look at one of the previous collections that I looked at as part of this search, I can go ahead and click on Old Town. It executes a new search. And it's going to bring up now, again, those 84 images that were part of that initial search result. So what we've done so far is we've kind of browsed the collection and we've done a fairly simple search of the collection. But you also have an advanced search capability with um, this particular software. If we go to the advanced search option, which is one of the places that it is, is up here at the top of the screen, and you click on advanced search. The last search that I executed um, was Pamela Prather, and so that search string is what's sitting in the box right now. But I want to do a different search this time. I want to take a look for some more photographs that Hill might have taken, the photographer Hill. I know that he took some that were part of the Old Town uh, collection, but there may be other photographs that he took that weren't part of that virtual collection. So I want to do um, in this case, a search for that photographer, but I want it to be a pretty targeted search because his name, Hill, if I just do a keyword search for Hill, I'm going to have a lot of um, digital objects in my search results set. I want to find just those things where he was actually the photographer. To do that, I would want to search across selected fields. And you'll notice that here next to search, if you can see the cursor there on the screen, my options are search across all fields, search selected fields. You can also do proximity searches. Um, and you can search by date. But for this one, I want to look for 
um, Mr. Hill as the creator of that intellectual content, so the creator of those photographs. So if I click on selected fields, what, this, what it, the system is doing now is giving me the option to choose which field I want to search on. And if I click on the drop down field, this gives me a list of all of the possibilities, all of the fields that I might search. In this case, I want to search the creator field, and I'm going to be searching for Hill. Now, right now, I'm going to be searching across all three of these collections. So those from Pasadena Public, the Museum of History, and Pasadena City. Notice that if I deselect, say, the Museum of History and Pasadena City, and I now have the, just the Pasadena Public Library selected, over here on the far right, there's a link that says Show Terms. If I click on Show Terms, the system is going to give me back, let me choose Creator here again. Not sure where my bar is. Do, 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 do. Let's try one of the other ones here. Okay, we'll do Name of Creator. If I click on Show Terms, any terms that have been entered in that field, so in your metadata record, they'll show up on the screen. So you can automatically tell whether or not you're going to find anything for Hill in that particular search. I see Hill there, so I know I'm going to find something. I'll go ahead and click on Close. And now I'll execute the search. So I'm just going to click on search. And we see that in addition to the two images that Hill, uh, or photographs that Hill took in Old Town, we have a total of four images now across, or in the um, Pasadena Museum collection. And there are um, the Presbyterian um, Church as well as the images that we saw earlier of the businesses in town. Let's go back and click on that advanced search screen again. And perhaps um, you're interested in knowing, say, what type of photographs that um, might be included in the collections of the institutions. So let's look for, in this case, um, let's look for stereographs. Um, stereographs, when you look at them, they're actually two photographs. They are two separate photographs. It's not the same photograph that's been duplicated. And when you look at it through a special viewer, um, it's kind of like a view master. It gives you a 3D image. So let's see if we can find any of these particular material types in the collections here. Um, let's go ahead and look across all three. We'll need to select material type again. And we'll click on search. Ah, we're not finding anything, so let's try. Let's look for just, let's look at just one institution. Let's try that one this time. And we'll look at uh, Pasadena Public. You'll notice that each time I'm changing from doing a search across multiple institutions to searching a single institution, you will need to reselect the field that you want to search on. So now we'll look for a material type. And we'll make this singular rather than plural. We'll click on Show Terms. It shows up in our list. And let's go ahead then and execute this search. Oh, OK. Right. So in addition to putting an S on the end of it, it was spelled wrong. And Content DM does have a spell check available to you. So it will come back in the most common errors, at least. It will ask you, I found something close. Is this what you're looking for? And you'll see that at Pasadena 
um, public library, they do have two um, stereograph images here. Now, whether or not they have the viewer, if you can come in and see them, that I don't know. <laughs> okay, any questions at this point? Well, I want to point out again on the left-hand side of the screen that we have faceted search results here. And so again, this is a way to execute a, a more targeted search of the collection materials. So if you have some general search terms that you um, are searching on, say perhaps as a keyword search, once you get into a search result set, then these facets on the left-hand side of the screen will allow you to execute a search, say, by date. So if you wanted to find something, um, if you wanted to find, say, one of the Rose Ball or the Rose Ball Queen from 1959, you could go ahead and select date. And again, what it's going to do is execute a very targeted search for you. So these can be a great strategy, a great way of um, executing searches that will really help you to identify and define those materials of particular interest to you. Now I should mention too that right now in this collection, there are primarily photographs. That is what um, the focus has been for all three of the institutions. But if you take a look at other um, institutions that are doing digital projects and those that are using this particular software, you'll see that they're using um, this for oral histories, they're using it for music, they're using it for video. You can also do some amazing things with text. So some of those um, letters uh, that you might have or um, postcards that you might have in collections within our institutions will be able to take a look at both, say, the front and back of a postcard in that text, that handwritten text that's on there. We can actually make that full text searchable for you. So those are the kinds of things that you can do with the tool that they've chosen. And I think that as you um, watch these collections grow in these institutions, you're going to see a variety of material types available to you. Well, thank you. Um, questions. What I would really like to suggest that you do at this point is on your screen, you have a link um, to the Pasadena Digital History Collection. Go ahead and click on that link and it will take you to the landing page that we were working from. And you can go in and simply browse the collections if you want to. Remember to browse those collections. You click on collections at the top of the screen and it will pull up a group of images and you can just browse through those. Or go ahead and search the collection. There's people here to um, assist you if you um, run into any difficulties or would like some, some assistance, or if you have questions about the materials and the collections or how to use the tool. Okay, well thank you. Um, hello, my name is Dan Baldwin. I'm a reference librarian here at the Pasadena Public Library. Um, it's my great honor to introduce um, Ms. Martinez here. Uh, I have a little bio here and I can quickly tell you that she is a city commissioner. She's a trustee on the Armory Center for the Arts. She's an advisor at the Pasco Museum of History and the Pasco Unified School District. And she has recently written a book, Latinos in Pasadena. Um, but what I'd actually like to share a little bit more with you is that I worked with Roberta um, for a few years here at the library. And I'm here to tell you she has two very big skill sets that she brings to any project that she does. First of all, she's a people person. She understands people, and she really has a passion for telling their story. Also, she has an ability to also go to sources. She doesn't accept the people at their face, but she looks deeper, and she takes the time to understand the facts behind the story, which then inflects how she presents the people themselves. So I'm sure that her book ex expresses that, and she's here to express that as well. So Roberta, thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's very kind of you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, um, one of the things about that's really cool about doing history and research is about meeting folks like Dan. And, and I won't do the mutual aid kind of a, a support fan club thing here, but it's very, very true. We're very fortunate in the city of Pasadena 
to have several institutions that really have valued history for a long time. Uh, the Pasadena Museum of History, here at the Central Library, and then we have cultural centers that have focused on the history that's in our area. So as an example, most people don't know that we have a Japanese cultural institute, and that the Japanese cultural institute has a lot of oral histories of that community that's here. We also have things like the, um, the Changing Rose, an effort that was done by the city and several members within our black community to get that portion of their history here. And so um, I lived here for 15 years before I knew there were ever any Latinos of any number or particularly involved in any way, shape, or form in the city. Because as you go around the city, you do not find any uh, plaques, or up until recently, you wouldn't find any plaques, you don't find memorials. When I would talk with people about that originally, they would say, well, we have that Spanish architecture and, and they meant it sincerely because that was their idea, that was their sense of what Spanish, Latino uh, experience had been here in the city of Pasadena. And because I was going down Lake Avenue or going on the 210 into Alvera Street or back to East LA where I grew up, that was my feeling too. Then I got to know some of the seniors that were living in the area and I began to hear some of their stories. And that was when I began to explore what actually was the histories of Latinos in Pasadena. And so what you see before you is an image that's done by Manuel Contreras. And I was really um, pleased to see this because it begins to talk about what the experience of Latinos in Pasadena has been. Here's a very formal mariachi uh, picture with City Hall as part of it. And I think for many of the people that have been a part of the history of Latinos in Pasadena, that's their sense of who they are. There is this presence in their lives of a cultural expression from which their parents came, but there's also this really, really, really strong sense of the city that they live in and that they love. And so as I was beginning to write the book, the first thing that I wanted to do, because I did not find inclusion of images of Latinos in the book, we found, come on, Martha. <laughs> um, I included an image from the Tongva, because the Tongva were here before all of the rest of us. And the images that I saw mostly of the Tongva, there we go, um, were the images that were post-secularization of the missions. So this was a community that had become somewhat destroyed. This was a community that was disenfranchised, very much marginalized, often absorbed into the larger Spanish-speaking community so that members of the Tongva nation would now have the last name Rodriguez or Martinez or Diego would be their first names or Maria would be the first name and their indigenous history was lost. And so I was lucky that J. Michael Walker let me use this image of Toipurina. And Toipurina has an interesting history in that she leads a revolt at the San Gabriel mission. So I wanted to start here and just kind of acknowledge Toipurina and the Tonga. And then there's my gal. Doña Eulalia Perez de Guillén de Mariné. This is a woman who is not an aristocrat, who is a widow, who works at the San Gabriel Mission for about 12 years, has an exciting adventure to get to that point, and then works with such diligence, has her daughters there with her, that she becomes what functionally is like the chief operating officer of the San Gabriel Mission, which was the richest out of, out of all the missions within the beautiful sort of mission chain. And so when lands have to be secularized, her oral history reports that she is taken in with the indigenous folks, with the natives, and say, yeah, essentially, so which of you give her permission to give your land to her? And they all raise their hands, and she is supposed to have this land reserved for her. Long story short, as happens often when you're changing countries, there are documents that are maybe filed, there are documents that are maybe lost, maybe accidentally, maybe a little less accidentally. There's fires that happen. And so long story short, she does not hold on to that land. But 
what does happen is that she becomes somebody who's really important to the geographical area of the San Gabriel Valley. So you have people like Lucky Baldwin bringing people in to meet her. And theoretically, if you look down over here, it's supposed to say she's 143 years old. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> but in all likelihood, there are many reports that think that she was as much as 103 years old. So on the one hand, she is this just kind of intriguing entity that's here that's a connection with Mexican, uh, Spanish, Mexican, California. And she is also somebody that the boosters that later on begin to bring people to Pasadena area are saying, look, if you live in Pasadena, that tuberculosis, that lung stuff that you're dealing with, all of the smoke of the cities, look what will happen to you. Um, so there is her image. And then here is an image of Rancho San Pascual that uh, existed when Manuel Garfias actually owned the land. Just, unfortunately, we have to go kind of fast. In the explorations of learning more about Latinos in Pasadena, one of the most surprising things I found is this house is a green and green. Arturo Bandini was the son of the last Secretary of State to Pio Pico. And so the idea that you have green and green mixed in with this California family is not something I would have expected. It was a surprise. And if you look up at the very, very top, I don't know, can you recognize what that is? It's La Virgen de Guadalupe. So we have a green and green in Pasadena, about uh, where on the middle of Caltech's campus that has the Virgen of Guadalupe. You begin to see how much sort of interaction and cultural exchange is taking place. You can also see some of the remnants of what's sort of culturally fun um, in the 19th century. So you have this wonderful bear, bear rug that's here. And if you could look closer around the house, you'd see other skins and such. Moving ahead kind of quickly, we find that we're having people that are not only the, living in, as Californios that are here, where there are people that are coming that are working in orchards. There are people that are coming that are working on the railways that are very much a part of our history. And there are people that are working on the um, sewer farm. Pasadena had a sewer farm. And um, it even, Pasadena having a strong chamber of commerce, even back in those days, would sell little packets of sewer powder, essentially. Um, and eventually, the neighboring community said, oh, you smell. And they shut it down. But if you ever wondered why walnut is named walnut, those are the trees. And much as you would see actually still today, unfortunately, there is the family working together out in the field. There, um, this is one of my favorite pictures because it begins to talk about how much interaction continued in Pasadena. This is a school, and it's along the Arroyo. And um, if you look carefully at the picture, it might be surprising if you think about who you imagine as having more money or less money in the area to see who has shoes and who doesn't have shoes, to see who has coats, to see who doesn't have coats. And to, uh, for example, this, this, one, this young woman here, if you could look more closely at your coat, you could see it probably belonged to somebody older and was sized down so that she could wear it. A very formal picture. Um, and I just kind of love all the attitudes that are there. Isn't that cool? Not every school in Pasadena was as mixed as that. In about 1911, in the south end of town, and 1915, over on the east end of town, two segregated schools were, except, were established for foreign-born Mexican children. And so you have Junipero Serra, which is established down at the south end of town, and Chihuahuita, which uh, develops on the east end of town. And um, among the attitudes that were prevalent, not only for Mexicans, but it, it, the impact was here for Mexicans, because we we're here, um, was these are children 
uh, reports will say that are not going to graduate from high school. So it is our duty to prepare them for the work that they're going to be doing. So these little girls, these fourth graders, as part of their curriculum are cooking for the school. And they're learning how to become cooks. They're learning how to become domestics. This is the same time that Americanization classes are going on. It's also at approximately the same time or uh, slightly thereafter um, when the Star News is busy reporting that some women in the neighborhood, Ms. Odell being one of them, is coming before the board of directors and is saying, so, well, these people are really dirty and the council directors say, oh, we forgot to put a sewer line there where they're living. And to this, these women's credit, they come and after a fashion, the sewer lines are in place. But I mean, it's one of those struggles where, that's going on in town. You can go ahead to the next one. And I just like these because so often we don't get, we see pictures of folks and we don't know who they are. And Stella Nunez Castro is just, she's like every little girl that somebody put her up on that chair. She wants to know when she can get down and why she has to stay there. I mean, it's just kind of that simple. That's over in Chihuahuita. And Mr. Magdaleno, was a union member and what he is working on with that super large me uh, mechanism is laying asphalt for the 110 freeway. So often we'll see workers' pictures and we don't know what their who their names were or whatever. So that's kind of special to me and it's so local. In the 40s we have folks like Joe Jaramillo that went off to Italy and unfortunately passed on. You know, he died while he was there and at the same time these are some images of some fellows that are living in the area that are working at Padua Hills. And there was a connection because of talent and practice with dance and songs and things like that, of people being both at the Playhouse sometimes and over at Padua Hills. And then this is just one of those things that if you think about it, you think, go back and imagine that family that's there picking walnuts there's an intermediate slide that I left out, which is some young women in their 20s that are flappers with their hair cut, and they're all girls together. Once you begin to get into this era, not only do you see different kind of fashion styles, but you begin to see these are boys and girls together. They're on an outing of some sort or the other. They've been somewhere together. There aren't, the larger extended family is not around. And sort of the, the approach to family style and interaction is changing and becoming somewhat, uh, for lack of a better phrase, Americanized. Post-World War, actually this is a little bit later than even that, but it's really cool. And this is the Guerrero family. We have a little more discretionary money. We have uh, uh, places, this is Lalo's in East LA. People now are traveling beyond Pasadena proper. Um, and they're having a couple of drinks. I love the Paps Blue Ribbon over <laughs> in East LA at Lalo's. The first simulcast of the Rose Parade, I was shocked to see when that took place. It's 1952. So we don't, we don't think, again, we don't think about that, but there's a lot of interaction that's taking place along two different streams. Now, up until you get pretty late into, uh, what is it, the 1980s, I think it is, is when you really begin to see a lot of Spanish language television. But back in the day, you have these folks that are there and they're watching the pictures and then over the radio, they're doing their little announcing. We have a gentleman's green card. We have Leo Carrillo who has a long time family history here and often was in the Rose Parade. And this is often how, when you think about Latinos in Pasadena, this would be one of those images that would come up. This is Canto Roblero. And he has a fascinating story that you can probably, I don't know whether or not it's still up, but he was a boxer. Well, actually, he was somebody who worked in the fields, decided working in the fields was too hard, so then he became a boxer because that was easier. <laughs> Which may tell you something about being in the fields, you know, right? And um, so unfortunately, he, he became blind. And he eventually became the only blind trainer that had his trainer's license for boxers in the state of California. 
He also was a coach for baseball teams after he lost his sight, which is kind of interesting. And I asked, so how does that happen? And they said, well, you know, you have coaches with sighted people. They say, you know, Joe over here needs to do his spitball is, uh, is not subtle enough. Or, you know, this, the batter is swinging this way or that way incorrectly. Well, he kind of worked with that too. Amazing. This is uniquely Pasadena and actually kind of goes back to the image we saw at the very beginning because this is the Mecha court. And this Mecha, for some people, um, these were the, the, the young people that when you hear about the walkouts, when you hear about sort of the slightly more political, slightly more younger uh, students that are involved with the Brown Berets, Mecha is that group. In Pasadena, though, we have a Mecha court. I don't know of any other place where you have the Mecha court with the woman, with the queen and the princesses that are there. We have some wonderful things that have happened in Pasadena in the 70s, Yvette Lightfoot, uh, televising Spanish, televising language long distance began in Pasadena for schools, for education, began out of Kalern. And um, Ms. Lightfoot and Elias Galvan set up television so that language could be learned. And they also set up television so that it was directed to the parents so they would get to know about their schools and how the school system worked so that the parents that are monolingual or dominant Spanish speakers would have a better idea of how to interact with the school district. And then Filemon Gutierrez was the first Latino member of the school board, and he was nominated by L.B. Hickenbottom. Okay. And this is just a little bit of life here in Pasadena, and this gentleman is still in the news. That's Ramon Cortines, who was here in, Pas yes, who was here in Pasadena was very active. Some of the more conservative board members actually fired him. There was a change in the board members, and he was rehired. So he has led a very interesting and tumultuous life. Um, coming off of the, the uh, Salvadorian uh, Civil War, and several of the things that were taking place at that time, you had a new surge of people that were coming in primarily before that time. The folks that were in the area were Mexicanos, Mexican-Americans, some Ch Chicanos that would be what they would call themselves. And then you began to see a complexity happening, a cultural um, um, sort of a new blood coming into the area with very, very different experiences. And we have the perpetual quinceañera. This is pictures taking place at the Arboretum. Okay. Council member Roy Ball was uh, the first Mexican American um, elected to the LA City Council in Los Angeles, and then eventually became a Congress member representing this area. And I love this because here you have folks that have been working for the city that sometimes, again, get left off. Here we have workers that are busy constructing city hall. I mean, often we don't have those names and we have the supervisors and the, the cool guys that have the architectural plant. And then you have all of these gentlemen that are making sure that the building stays upright following those plans. Both are very, very much needed. And these are some folks that have owned restaurants in the area. Jesusita Mijares that has his own, her own exciting story, the Mejia family, and Mr. Abel Ramirez. Lest you think we've not had Rose Queens. <laughs> um, Le, uh, queen Liana Yamasaki was the first Rose Queen with Latino heritage. And she is the son of Elena and Jose Yamasaki. Grandfather, and they're from Peru. Grandfather on one side is Chinese. Grandfather on the other side is Japanese, which begins to talk a little bit about the complexity of uh, mestizaje or mixed heritage that is very much a part of Latino experience. 
And then these are pictures that are taken at the Latino Heritage Parade. I had to do just about 15, 30 seconds because that's what we're doing tomorrow. We're going to have 960 children from our school district marching in the streets and then celebrating at La Pintoresca Park. We're going to have a historical fashion show inside the library where the children are going to have a chance to do living history. They're going to put on these clothes starting from about the 1840s. And here's some of the history, some of the information that I'm sharing with you. They're going to be able to experience firsthand so that they then begin to have an appreciation of history. And this legacy of history, this legacy of experience will be continued. And here we have Vice Mayor Victor Gordo, a couple other members in the community. And um, he is just too cute. There's no way I could not have him in here. And one year we were highlighting, uh, we were highlighting wrestlers. This is my neighbor and her daughter. And it was just too precious and too fun a mood not to include. And once a year we have a Latino recognition ceremony. And all of the students who have stayed in school through the 12th grade, they may not have graduated, but they've stayed in school are recognized. And they don't sometimes get a chance to be recognized otherwise for that achievement. And that's it in a nutshell. Thank you very much. There's too much teacher in me, so I wasn't sure are there any questions? <laughs> there were a variety of sources, one of them being the Centennial Room. Um, and actually, you can talk to, to Dan afterwards. It's a gloved kind of situation. And some of the pictures were from the Pasadena Museum of History. Some of them were for the Huntington Library. Some of them for the Los Angeles Public Library. Some of them were from the Bancroft Library. I love doing research. So it was a chance to do all of that, that and put it together. About midway through, there were community members that began to, to offer support for this and to keep the story going along because there are not a lot of places where you can find that's the, the history that you're seeing there. And that, quite frankly, is one of the reasons why the book ended up being written, uh, so that people could look at, you know, we have about 180 pictures in the book. And, um, and that's just the top, you know, that's just the very top, because just, just I found about 500 pictures to look through. And I still had, last week actually I was at the Duarte Festival of Authors and I had a person come up to me and said, you know, you should have interviewed my grandfather. <laughs> you know, you really, you really just, you didn't do it right, you didn't interview my grandfather. And there are so many stories that whenever I talk about the book, I just say that this is a history and that there are many, many more that should be written. You know, we have people in the, the book whose heritage are native, indigenous, Californian, Pasadena, you know, Pasadenans that are here three, four, five generations. You have some people that have just gotten here in the last year. You have some people that are of Cuban heritage. I mean, that was a shocker because I was off doing something. I talked with somebody and he said their family was Cuban and they came to Pasadena because of All Saints. Which, right, I wondered what the heck was that about? Well, it turned out that All Saints was among those organizations that found homes for the Cubans when they came. And it turns out further that many of those same folks went to work in Vernon. And there was, you know, there's that pool that if you know somebody, the next two or three people go and they work with them. I mean, we do it with ourselves. If you know there's a better deal at Vons, you go to the Vons. If you hear Trader Joe's getting a deal from your friends, you go to Trader Joe's. And so when you begin to talk about cultural foods or cultural uh, churches, things like that, people will tend to kind of cluster together. Um, they had a baseball league here in Pasadena in the 60s. So there was a, a lot of history there. Good question. <laughs> we just happened to have 
copies of the book here tonight. <laughs> the, yes, really. And, and I would even sell them, which would be really cool. Yes. Well, and, and if that, lest that be, that there is some part of me that, that I think uh, just needs to make sure that this information is getting out to everybody. We're very fortunate that the different branches of our library and different places like the Museum of History has a copy of the, the, the book. So yes, I would love for you to buy it, but if you have friends that would like to know more about that history and they can't afford to do it, we have us some really fine libraries. And next to, next to, or I get to be next to some really wonderful books that give a slightly different perspective on the experience of Pasadena. And it's by looking at all of those different experiences that we get a better sense of who we are and what this community is that we live in. Actually, if I can just jump in. Um, we actually do have some photos when you're talking about Americanization. Um, yes. Classes here in, in the Paris School. Um, they actually already are in this database. So one of the places you can look for pictures of Hispanics or passing industry in general is this database. And again, it's an example of how we're um, collaborating and getting a lot of stuff. These are actually photos taken from the uh, school board. Uh, this is from 1919. And again, it's like you mentioned, they're really not books and domestics and things like that. So we do have a lot of these photos already on the... Uh, yeah, do the mothers. I haven't seen that one big, please. <laughs> well, see, and look at, look at this. I mean, here's what's so wonderful, and here's what's in this collection, and here's what's so very powerful about this, this whole digital collection, is that if you look at this, there is so much that's going on in the picture. I mean, here is this woman with the hat. Look at what this woman is wearing. You see some folks with the kind of clothes that they're wearing that's talking about the experiences they're coming from, the economy in which they're living, um, and the idea that they're really, I mean, here's one of the interesting things, the idea that they want to learn about this new place where they're living. You know, they are actively involved and they want to participate in what's going on, which, um, is just stunning, and, and the collection is, I'm just so thrilled. Anything else? Any other questions? Or? Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. And historian. Uh, she is also a Pasadena Digital History Collaboration Advisor. She's on our advisory board, which we're very glad to have you. Uh, she was born in Taiwan and raised in the Philippines. She has volunteered for several historical societies, societies including the Chinese Historical Society of Southern California, the Filipino American National History Society, the San Gabriel Historical Association, and Monrovia Historical Society. So, no further ado, enjoy the talk. Okay. Well, thanks for coming, everyone. And I, I'm working with a bad cold, so if I get into a fit, you know what's going on. Ever since I was a little girl, I loved old people. I don't know how to say that nicely, but it's true. And I didn't know you could do anything with this love of old people, but um, I realized somewhere along my life that oral histories are lots and lots of fun. So what you do with an old hi oral history is you sit down and you listen and you have a tape recorder on, and, but, but it's, it's a kind of listening that is really um, different. You know, I guess I don't really listen to other people yelling at me or telling me things to do, but when it's an oral history, I sit there and I really, really listen. Then I listen it to it again, and I think that really is very important because I then type out the transcript. So I've had the great, great fortune of interviewing about 25 Asian American women who were in the 1960s, 70s Asian American movement in Los Angeles in the 60s and 70s. And that was so much fun. Then I realized somewhere along the line that, hey, there's other people you could do oral histories of. So I started to do the Niseis in the San Gabriel Valley or Japanese Americans who um, were here. I would. 100% more preferred to interview the Issei's, or the first generation of Japanese Americans in the Singapore Valley. But by the time I realized this, 
um, it was a little late. Um, so I thought what I would do is, I actually checked into the digital collection a little bit and didn't see some of the images that, um, that um, the Japanese Americans have collected. So they've done a couple of reunions. That I'll pass these around for show and tell. Cause, um, and um, so then I thought the best thing for me to do is to uh, show some show and tell of some of the actual work that I have done. Um, in these particular cases, I have gotten release forms, so I think it's okay to show and tell. Um, but I guess I, I don't know if people are thinking about oral histories and the beauty of them and um, whether, um, here, let me just pass it into the back. So I guess I wanted to serve as a resource person. There are some, I think, ethical issues when you do oral histories that one should be aware of. There's some, a lot of logistical things that people should think about, I guess. And so I was just going to open it up. And if people want me to talk more about Asian Americans, you'd have to shut me up, you know, kind of thing. But otherwise, I'm kind of open to if anybody had thoughts or have done family histories. Anybody interested in family histories? Are you doing members of your family? Um, you've done family men? Well, I've got an oral history. Oh, see, that's the stuff, the genealogy and your mother's uh, audio. Um, and th then there's the big debate whether to videotape or not videotape, right? Well, Did you video? English, no, this was a long time ago. Okay. Audio tape. And then because her English was so poor, you know, I transcribed it and made it more intelligible. What was her native language? Um, Hungarian. Yeah. That's so precious. Yeah, yeah. two years of education. Yeah. It's, and, it, and when you do a family history, it's something that you keep for your children and the grandchildren and the cousin and the once cousins. removed. And, you know, and, and, and in, in this case, since my husband's Japanese American family had passed, etc., I was borrowing from it. And I'm not even related, you know, kind of thing. But all, all is fair. You did a family history as well? Did you say? Genealogical research? And we didn't really write down enough things in time. And sometimes, by the time someone is, is becoming ill, or they, they really have reached past the point where they really want to stop, stop and talk about things. So you, try, you kind of have to try to watch me. Right time when, when they want to start to tell about things because sometimes they'll tell you will you'll get different you will get different versions at different times too. Right. I have to say that I think it's harder to do family members. It is easier for me to do strangers or you know relative strangers because one of the ethical questions is it's their version of the story and when it's a family member, you might have remembered it differently, or you might have known that Uncle Joe didn't exactly think of it like that. So it is kind of a nice comfort, I have to admit, to do a stranger. I think if you ever did an auto bio, it would be extremely hard. Do you think you could write your own story? I, I don't think I would ever go there, but for someone else to interview me, it would be a joy. You know, it would, then I could tell the story the way I want to tell the story, not the real story. So there are ethical issues, but you know, yeah. The interesting thing about those reunion photos is it's of a Los Angeles county that doesn't exist anymore when it was agricultural. So in this particular case, these Japanese Americans knew each other from, you know, because the community was small. It was an ethnic community like you're talking about. And year after year, they would have their annual picnics and their, you know, so they known each other since childhood. So when they were in their 70s and 80s, they planned a couple of reunions. And what they did, which was so fantastic, is everybody brought the one or two family photos they had and they Xeroxed it for everybody, you know, because 
I might not have a f picture, and, and this picture is kind of like my, you know, my cousin or my, my school or what they call Gakuen's or Japanese school or my Buddhist temple. And so they very nicely let me have a couple of copies too so that, you know, and they, you can see the today and after kind of uh, situation. So that was a very nice ethnic thing um, for the communities to get together. LA has an incredible ethnic diversity from day one. Um, Croatians, I mean, we're not even just talking about French and Italian and Japanese, but you know, everything under the sun. Yiddish, we've, as some of you know, we had gypsy populations in East LA. I just can't imagine. How did gypsies get to LA? Um, does anybody want, do you, are you guys interested in oral histories or have your family been in Los Angeles a long time? You're, oh, okay. You mentioned gypsies. We went to the county fair. The well were on the side, it was too early in the day, but they had a, a gypsy uh, area, you know, with, with half a dozen booths. Really? And it wasn't staffed at the yeah. time we were there. So she, he's saying that they're still gypsies. Are you guys longtime Los Angelinos? Well, they call themselves travelers. Travelers. Okay, I gotta learn those terminologies. Yeah. Anybody have any questions about oral histories? So the issue about videotaping, um, you know, some people say videotape your family. In my experience, when you, vi even for me, an old, older people especially, it's very uncomfortable under the camera, right? And so. It, I don't know. I'm not real fond of videotaping myself. Um, so I'll, I'll guess I'll share with you. So I interviewed about 25 Japanese from the San Gabriel Valley. And what a rich, rich history. So a lot of them were farmers. Um, this one guy I have to share with you. I usually interview about two hours, and I've done many of them, so I'm kind of into the, you know, mode. He sits me down. I didn't leave. I didn't get up for until four hours later. This guy had planned for my coming, and he was going to tell me everything. And what he wanted to say, in essence, was it wasn't all good. He wanted to talk about his parents almost killing each other. He wanted to talk about alcoholism. He wanted to talk about, it was a rough life. It was a farming life, and it was not always of fun and games. Um, sure. Yeah, when you, I, I also encourage students to do oral histories. And as with carpentry or quilting or anything, one third is preparation. Actually very little, or vacations, very little is doing, and then at least one third is clean up. Um, you know, it's like, so the prep work is incredibly hard. You really got, I really walk into an interview already kind of knowing where I want to go with this. Sometimes I'm totally surprised and I have to change, change gears. But with everything, with cooking, right, it's a lot of prep work, very little glory, and then a lot of cleanup. And the cleanup is you got to type out, I, I'm a strong believer that you've got to type out your transcripts. Um, because without the transcripts, um, I can't depend on my memory. Now you translate it, so that makes it even a higher level of difficulty. I do not believe in word-to-word -word transcribing. Um, I find that we, the way we talk is not the language that we write, and it would be a disservice to the person if I just captured their words. It's not the way we write, so forget it. You know, that's not gonna happen. So young people, younger people should, you know, I hope you think about your family members because as the other gentleman was saying, uh, it goes fast, so. Well, in, in our case, it was 
you know, my mother's grandchildren who are asking grandma the questions. That's really they precious. Really well. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, old peop older people, I think they really have a lot to teach us. And so one of the, the first teachers at Alhambra, a Japanese American teacher at Alhambra, said that he couldn't, he, it was ironic, he, his father was a uh, minister and so he had gone to Occidental College, he was very well educated. And he was Japanese American in the 1950s and he taught English. <laughs> I thought that was really funny. So this one, the first Japanese American teacher, he taught English. He taught journalism at Alhambra High for a long time. But to support his family, he had this part-time job as a, um, as a grocer, um, a part-time. And um, people would come up to the grocery uh, counter and say, oh, there's a Jap teacher. And um, and this was after internment in the 1950s. After that, I kind of shut my mouth about complaining about any hardship that I might have. I figure I have nothing to complain about. It's, it's just thank you to the ancestors. It's been so much easier since then. Yeah. But oral histories, I'm not a techie, but then now we're going into photographs. Um, for some of the ethnic communities, uh, photographs are a rarity. Roberta Martinez talked about the few Latino Mexican photos that she's been able to capture from Pasadena. And I think the digital project that we've been working on has not had that many Asian American images. Um, even today, Asian American images of public events is not in the archives of the mainstream culture. And I'm not really sure what to do about it, but that's another game that, uh, that, that hasn't even started. So. so I guess I want to encourage everyone to, you know, dig into their family history and think about that and capture some of that, uh, that life. Is, are your parents nearby? Huh? Are your parents nearby? No. Yeah, grandparents or they passed. Some of us um, it's a little bit different experience because everything is so digitalized that it's there forever. Everything is so territorial. The um, the genealogies are digital. No, no, is that what you? Like I have a daughter. Everything from she, since she was born. I don't really have hard copies of her picture. They're all on the internet. That's an interesting concept. I'm sorry, I have to kind of change my mind. That's different. You know, all these little things you did, it can be recorded and stored. The thing about an oral history, though, it's not about what was the moment. It was, it's not about this minute or this year. It's about a life. So I don't think you can tell the story as well until it's over. And it's kind of like, after you watch the movie, how did you feel about it? So if you ask me in the middle of the movie, how do I feel about the movie, I might say it's boring. But then after I finish the novel or the movie or the meal, I have a different comment. So again, my interest in old people is, is, uh, is uh, you know, is kind of, um, is founded. So I, I do wonder, you know, when your daughter is, is older, how we would capture that life. That's interesting. Wow. I, I, I prepare heavily, so I, um, well, I like to start out with, how did your family come here? You know, I would go beyond the birth. I would, so then I would say childhood, young adulthood, in this particular case, concentration camp, adjustment back from concentration camp. So not only do I have questions, I have sections that, that I may not go into. As a scientist, I go into social organizations, 
discrimination. I mean, I really have categories before I walk in. But I also like to end up with open-ended questions, like things like, you know, it depends on, you know, um, what do you think of California today and the, and the changes that have happened, or, um, you know, what would you like your grandchildren to know about your um, parents or your, you know, your ancestors. But I always like to throw in a, you know, it's, I'm a bad, um, I, I'm bad in that I want an ending to my story, so then I actually add leading, ask leading questions to, so that I can write a conclusion, you know, so, so that this is going to end up with a, you know, a nice statement, you know, um, and, and I, and, and I think it's fair. I always give transcripts back to my interviewee for review. I think that especially if there are living people, it's not my goal to hurt anyone's feelings. And I think with family history, this is very difficult because it's not the goal to say, you know, Uncle Joe should have done this or, you know, Auntie Mary was a lush. No, that's not the point here. So it becomes very difficult with family histories. That's why I have several versions of my Several movies. versions. The one I keep in my heart and the one I keep in my head and, and the one that's written. Version, you, know, you can edit them on the computer. Isn't that so wonderful? Person A gets version one, person B gets version two. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Very clever. So you use a tape recorder as what you do? I use a tape recorder, but I, you know, because these are not my family members, I erase. Um, I'm not sure about the ethics of that, but I erase. After I transcribe, I erase. Um, I, I just don't personally value tape. Um, it may be a, a love for books, a love for paper, a young, an older perception of paper, but I don't value tapes. Um, we don't, and I've listened to tapes on the internet, and you know, we were talking about the board of trustee meetings. It's not how it should be um, written down. So I just don't. It's a different language. I actually have videotapes of my kids. I never watch them. For me, it was a memory, and it's finished. It's it's in my heart, in my head, and I'm not gonna um, I'm not gonna watch it again. I don't know. It's a different philosophy, I'm sure. Well, okay. I know we have an 8:30 one about the Rose Bowl, so uh, that's certainly part of our community history. So thank you very much for your patience. Um, she also works in uh, the collections department as our collections manager. We believe in multitasking at the museum. <laughs> and she serves on our collections committee. And her most recent uh, coup is her recent publication on the history of the Rose Bowl, sold by Arcadia Press, which we do have for sale outside later, and she will gladly autograph for you. So, I'd like Michelle, thank you. Thank you. Now, what's really interesting about the Rose Bowl is that even though it was built specifically for college football, it wasn't actually built for a specific college football team. It was, of course, as you can tell by the name, built for the Tournament of Roses. And it was this man right here. This is W.L. Nishman. He was Tournament of Roses president in 1920. And he was a very groundbreaking president. He was actually the very first president to run down the Rose Parade in a car rather than a carriage and that's his son driving. And Leishman had grown up in Connecticut, which was home of the Yale Bowl. So he wanted his new hometown to have something just as nice as his old one. And to do that, he got Pasadena architect Myron Hunt to build the stadium for him. And the original um, stadium was uh, built here. And this is what the Arroyo actually looked like before the stadium was built. And according to Lothrop, Leishman's son, when Leishman told Hunt about his idea, he took him down to the Arroyo, and to get an idea of what the stadium would look like, Hunt held up a piece of paper with a hole cut out of it and put it in front of him to kind of see where the stadium would be. The stadium's original design wasn't actually a bowl. It was a horseshoe. So this is how it was built when it was built in 1922. 
And it actually stayed this way for about six years until it was enclosed in 1928. Now what's interesting is that even though this was original design, it already was given the name the Rose Bowl. There was another advantage to closing in the field besides getting more seats. It kept out the sheep. The Arroyo Seco had a lot of squatters. There were some local farmers still down there in the 1920s. And as you saw from the pre-construction photo, the land in the Arroyo wasn't all that great. So what are you going to do when suddenly a nice field appears in the middle? <laughs> this is the very first Rose Bowl game. Now, it wasn't actually the first game played in the stadium. The first game played in the stadium was in October 1922. So they built the stadium in less than a year. But the first Rose Bowl game was played on January 1st, 1923 and this was between Penn State and USC. Now, I do want to point out that even though this photo shows a play that resulted in three points for Penn State, USC did in fact win the game. <laughs> the Rose Bowl saw lots of great sports moments even early on in its history. This is from the 1925 game with the famous Notre Dame Four Horsemen. Now, believe it or not, the guy in this photo was nicknamed Sleepy Jim by his coach. I think he was the fastest guy on the field. And what's crazy is he almost didn't even play in the game because he was caught out late buying postcards by his coach the night before. Now, unfortunately, in sports, not everyone's going to necessarily have the fondest memories of a game. And this is very true for Roy Regals in 1929. Yeah. Many of you have probably heard of him referred to as wrong way Roy Regals. <laughs> and that is because this California center in 1929 got a hold of the ball and ran 65 yards down the field. Unfortunately, it was in the wrong direction. <laughs> Literally, the only thing that stopped him a yard away from the goal line was his own teammate. <laughs> Roy was a good sport about it, though, and he did go on to be inducted into Cal's Hall of Fame and the Rose Bowl Hall of Fame. Uh, while he was alive, he even joked that Georgia Tech should have enrolled him into their Hall of Fame because it's because of him that they won the 1929 Rose Bowl <laughs> by only one point. Now, back in the day, the football players would get to ride down the Rose Parade before the game. And this is the University of Washington before their game. And this was probably the most relaxing part of the day for these gentlemen. That year happened to be the most brutal Rose Bowl game in history. Both the University of Washington and the Naval Academy had injured players carried off the field, not all of them conscious. And Washington's kicker managed two conversions with a broken toe. And in case you're curious, after all that, the game ended in a tie. <laughs> the Rose Bowl inspired the Junior Chamber of Commerce of Pasadena to host the Junior Rose Bowl, which was played periodically between 1946 and 1976. And this was a postseason bowl game for the junior colleges. And what was really great about this is that whereas with the Pac-10 teams for the Rose Bowl, you could have a team that was from California, Washington, Arizona. But with um, the Junior Rose Bowl, there was always a California representative. So that made it very uniquely local and national game. The Junior Rose Bowl followed many traditions of the Rose Bowl. This is Miss Junior Rose Bowl, who in her white suit and with roses looks very reminiscent of a rose queen. And local celebrities also got involved with the Junior Rose Bowl, just like they did the Rose Bowl. Bob Hope was Grand Marshal for the Tournament of Roses for, on two different occasions. And he also posed for this photo op for the 1960 Junior Rose Bowl. Now, one thing that might have enticed Mr. Hope to pose for this photo is that Bob Hope was a noted philanthropist, and the Junior Rose Bowl was always a charity game. It always benefited a local charity. 
Now, the whole reason the Tournament of Roses started hosting football games in the first place was because they wanted Pasadena and their day of festivities to become nationally and internationally renowned. And they had chosen football because they thought that was the best way to do it, because everybody loves football. Well, nothing puts you on the international map more than an Olympic game. So when the 1932 Olympic Games came to Los Angeles, the Rose Bowl was actually the only non-aquatic venue outside of the city of Los Angeles to host a game. And they hosted the cycling event, which was, of course, men's cycling, because women's cycling was not in the Olympics yet. They also hosted an event at the 1984 Olympics, except this time it was soccer. And the US team did actually get to play a game at the Rose Bowl. Um, unfortunately, they lost to Italy, but we did get to see the US team play here at home. Now, the Rose Bowl also later went on to stay involved with international soccer by hosting the Men's World Cup in 1994 and the Women's World Cup in 1999. Well, when the Men's World Cup came to town, there was a little bit of a controversy, which I don't know if you all remember. There was a large sign placed outside of the Rose Bowl. It said World Cup Los Angeles. Needless to say, the City Council of Pasadena was not too thrilled with that sign. However, there were local organizations around town that made their own signs that made it perfectly clear to visitors exactly what city they were in. And this particular mural was actually on the Armory for the Arts building over on Raymond. The Rose Bowl has also always been a very important community center, and since it was built, it hosted mass graduation ceremonies for most of the local schools. This graduation ceremony is from 1924. And as you can tell, they were very ornate. They had a lot of decor. Actually, in all of the articles that describe them, they were always referred to as the graduation pageant rather than the graduation ceremony. Um, I don't know if you can tell, there's a windmill up there. There's some bridges and some benches. And each year was a different theme. And of course, they hosted the fireworks show, which the fire department began in the 1920s and continued to do until the 80s, until the city passed it over. This was taken in 1935, so they were big and spectacular even from the beginning. And of course, the flea market. The flea market is one of the biggest flea markets in the world. Uh, JK Canning claims that over a million items go on sale and about 20,000 people every Sunday or every Sunday um, when it's the first Sunday of the month come to shop here. And what's interesting is you know that's no ordinary swap meet when there are postcards representing the city of Pasadena that actually solely feature the Rose Bowl flea market. Now, Rose Bowl doesn't actually have a track anymore. It did in the 60s and 70s. It was removed, but the Rose Bowl doesn't really need a track because there's a loop around the Rose Bowl that is very heavily used by joggers, bicyclists. And this photo actually ran in a Pasadena Star News article with a story saying that they were considering actually closing the streets around the Rose Bowl to car traffic because it was so popular with bicyclists. Now, of course, as part of a philanthropic community, the Rose Bowl also got involved in numerous fundraisers. And in 1955, the Rose Bowl played host to a circus that was being held by the Boy Scouts. And the Boy Scouts might have gotten the idea because in 1953, two years earlier, two circuses had come to town and performed at the Rose Bowl. One was, of course, the famous Barnum and Bailey which actually, when they got to the Rose Bowl, found out they were a little too big and had to actually perform in the parking lot. And the smaller Black Brothers Circus, which did fit in the stadium and also performed later that year. Well, the stadium that was built for college football finally got a college football team in 1982 when the UCLA Bruins came to town. And of course, that means that every other year, the Rose Bowl gets to host the infamous UCLA-USC match. And for a while, the bands of USC and UCLA even had their own band bowl. 
Now, before the Rose Bowl played the home field of UCLA, it was the home field to many of the local schools. John Muir High, Pasadena High, John, um, John Muir Tech, JC, PCC, and it was often the home field for these teams at the same time. So it was a very, very busy field during the football season. And of course, that meant that the famous turkey tussle between John Muir High and Pasadena High was played at the Rose Bowl. The Rose Bowl has also held a number of different concerts. Most recently, you guys know U2. There were 97,000 people who came to attend that concert. They also have seen the Eagles, Depeche Mode, Guns N' Roses. In the 1980s, the concerts and peace rallies were actually more of a political nature. People came to the Rose Bowl for what was known as Peace Sunday to um, promote the anti-nuclear peace rallies. One of the more controversial events that has taken place at the Rose Bowl were the motocross races. And I say controversial because no one living in the Arroyo liked that they were there. Which you can understand why. This is from the Mickey Thompson Grand Prix Championship in 1989. And to make the Rose Bowl Stadium look like that, they had to bring in 700 truckloads of dirt and clay. Now, for you football fans, if you're wondering the same thing I was wondering, the field underneath is protected. Before they brought in all that clay, they had to lay down plywood and plastic over the field so that when they removed that, everything was protected. Now, like I said, a lot of people weren't happy about this races, but historic precedent was slightly working against them because there had been races way back in the 1940s at the Rose Bowl. Granted, much different kinds of cars. There were actually midget races. And the first one that was at the Rose Bowl actually broke an attendance record. Rodeos were another controversial event that took place at the Rose Bowl for a while. They had a few in the 70s and then again in the 80s. They stopped because animal rights groups um, boycotted them. And the city eventually voted to ban all animal activities from city-owned property and the Rose Bowl is city-owned property, unless the group who came in got permission from the Pasadena Humane Society. Needless to say, the rodeos never got permission again from the Pasadena Humane Society. Now, there were a couple exceptions made to these rules. One were the equestrian groups who would perform on January 1st. They didn't have to get permission. And also cat and dog shows, which actually worked out well, because otherwise, Ashley Whippet might not have come to Pasadena. <laughs> Ashley Whippet was here for the Frisbee competition that took place in 1976. It was a human world competition, but there was also a dog competition component, and Ashley, of course, won. And Pasadenans were so impressed with Ashley that they actually brought him back the next year to perform at the Super Bowl. The Rose Bowl has played host to five Super Bowls. Now what's interesting is it's only one of two teams to do this without actually being the home of an NFL team. The other stadium is Stanford Stadium up in Northern California. Now this was um, a very, very packed game. As you can see, one reason I love this photograph is because it's one of the few where you can barely actually see where the tunnels are. Like, I think that's one there. And that's really the only one I can see. And there's a reason for that. Over 103 people came to that game. Yeah. And, oh, sorry, over 103,000. Thank you. <laughs> and um, it continued to be a popular spot because, like I said, this was the first one. And they did hold four more. And it brought all sorts of people from around the country to Pasadena. Now. Can anyone tell me who these gentlemen came to support at the 1983 Super Bowl? Miami Dolphins versus Washington Redskins. These gentlemen came to support the Killer Bees from Miami. And the team had Killer Bees at that time because the defensive line had six players all with the last name B. So we had quite a few football fans who came in festive costume. 
the Super the Rose Bowl also experienced a Super Bowl first at the 1993 Super Bowl. And that is because Michael Jackson performed the halftime show. So for the first time in Super Bowl history, the Nielsen ratings were higher during the halftime show than during the actual game. <laughs> and of course, what's an event at the Rose Bowl without a parade? We all know that there's a parade on January 1st, but the Junior Rose Bowl also had a parade. The World Cups also had a parade. And of course, there were slightly inebriated celebrations down Colorado Boulevard before each Super Bowl. And I think that's what makes the Rose Bowl so great and what shows that it's such an integrated part of our community now, because it started off with being an afterthought after a parade, and now it inspires parades itself. Thank you.